I've heard people talk about the itch for martial arts. And that was the night, that first night, training in the dark, where I knew I got the itch. It was a moment of realizing I, I'm not made out of glass. It's time for another great episode of Martial Arts Radio, the show that brings you amazing stories from the world's best martial artists. Today, we're talking to Mr. Daniel Hartz as we bring you episode 132. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. Today, we're featuring our No Sweat t-shirts. They're great, lightweight, polyester t-shirts that work really well under your uniform and really just around the house or at the gym. They're super lightweight, have our really, at this point, kind of famous slogan, never settle on the back, and they're available in a variety of colors over at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, including links to everything we talk about today with Mr. Hartz, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, why not? We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists in an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. You may recognize today's guest from his appearance on episode 100. Mr. Daniel Hartz was the interviewer for my episode of the show, and it's been an honor to have him back for his turn at the table. While there are no firm rules about who we have on the show, we generally only extend the invitation to black belts. Mr. Hartz recently earned his black belt in a weekend-long testing ceremony I was fortunate enough to participate in. On today's episode, we learn a lot about not only Mr. Hartz, but about what it is that draws people to martial arts and keeps them there. As a recent black belt, Mr. Hartz doesn't have the decades of training many of our guests do, But that gives him a valuable, different perspective on training. He's very open about himself and his love for the arts, which I suspect will resonate for all of our listeners. It certainly did for me. Mr. Hartz, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. So, long-time listeners will hear the difference in the audio quality. They'll know that we are sitting face-to-face, which is not the norm for the show. And I think the last time we had an episode that was in person, um, was you and I just in opposite roles. Um, anyone that listens to the show again, knows that for episode 100, you interviewed me. I sure did. Which was a lot of fun. It was, was. it was different. And honestly, it's completely changed in a subtle way, but still completely changed the way I handle myself when I'm talking to people. So thank you for that. But I know you've listened to the show, and of course, you not too long ago had the distinction of earning your black belt. I did. That was a wild weekend. It was a wild weekend, and I was honored to be there for part of it. So you're the first person that's kind of been waiting in the wings. There's this uh, sort of unofficial rule for the show that we don't interview someone that's not a black belt. And, and I say unofficial just because that's how it's worked out. Um, and I, I knew that you would be testing, and I assumed passing your test soon. So we just kind of held off. So here we are. So I'm pumped that we get to do this. This is also the first interview to happen in my home. So all, all kinds of firsts going on here. So let's dig in. Let's Let's... You know, we'll give the listeners more of what they're tuning into. They're not here to talk about all the the weird bingo checkboxes for first this and first that that are going on. How'd you get started in the martial arts? So it was about 10 years ago. And um, you and I were talking a little informally before about how I took some time off from college and I played in a band. I toured around for a while. Um, and I had a great time doing that. Learned a lot about myself. 
I was studying music in school, and so I was like, maybe I just need to do this. Maybe I don't need to do the school thing. Took some time, and ended up going back to school. When I went back to school, I reintroduced myself um, to a man who has been on your show before, Sensei Earl Smith. And he's a very, very humble person. When I first met him, he was a public safety officer at the college that I went to. And I worked in residence life, and so we interacted quite a bunch um, professionally. And he talked about over and over again how he had... He had a small martial arts school, and uh, he's been training for a long time, and he really loves teaching. He'd be happy to have me. I expressed an interest in martial arts because I unfortunately uh, wasn't allowed to do martial arts despite having interest uh, when I was very young. But at this opportunity, I'm in. I'm back in college. I'm an independent person. Uh, I think I would. I must have been. Yeah, I was. 19, maybe I had turned 20. I think I was 19. Um, and it started at like 2 in the morning because he worked the night shift. He worked a lot of times 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. And, and I was a college student, so staying up late was not a big deal for me. So he's like, come find me sometime when I'm on duty. I'm on campus. I'll take one of my breaks and we'll do some training. And so that's what we did on his lunch break. He took his time on his break to start teaching me the basics. This was my first introduction to it. So we're just one-on-one -on -one Mr. Miyagi style. Mm. We're um, in the middle of the dark, a little bit of light from like a walkway light, but in the dark. So we're learning by feel or I'm learning by feel, and he's teaching me techniques that I my body's moving in ways I've never moved before, um, and feeling some, and in some cases, some pain I'd never <laughs> felt before. Uh, and, and I've heard people talk about the itch for martial arts, and that was the night, that first night, training in the dark, where I knew I got the itch. It was it was a moment of realizing I I'm not made out of glass. There's there's a culture now of helicopter parents and hypersensitivity to um, to protecting oneself. And the discipline that I study, there is there is there's a lot of pain. But it's not long term. Yeah. It's uh, it's temporary. And then when I got that taste of it, like it can hurt and it goes away. It can hurt and it goes away. And learning about my own body at the time, I was my balance wasn't so good, coordination wasn't so good. I'm very tall. I grew very fast. It just it made so many sense in different ways that this was the right thing for me to do. This is the right physical activity for me, uh, and it was engaging different parts of my, my mind and my body at the same time. And then there was a summer as a, all of our um, black belt candidates, our brown belts, they will test at a camp where they're typically multi-day camps where the candidate is not just tested for what they know, but it's tested, they're tested for perseverance. And I'm there showing up as a white belt. This is the first time I've ever actually put on a belt. Mm -hmm. Somebody had bought a uniform and it came with an extra belt. The belt, I think, was too small. So I show up, I got gym shorts on and a t-shirt and a white belt. Everybody else is in uniforms. I feel the odd one out, but I'm like, I'm all lined up. I'm at the end of the line, but I'm all lined up with all these other martial arts. There must have been like, I don't know, probably... 14 of us there and then a bunch of black belts in the front and then and a couple of brown belt candidates that were running the class and it's a really hot summer day and we're doing moves that i hadn't done before 
because this is a formal class. This isn't just training one-on-one -on -one out in the dark. This is, this is class now. And so I'm starting to get exposed to some of that regular discipline and why it's called a martial art is that the martial part is that it can be often associated with military of where the, where the art came from. And it has that order to it, that discipline. And I'm lined up and I'm just doing punches. We're doing kicks. Um, and I'm getting an incredible workout because it's this brown belt who's really got something to prove. And so he's working us. And I'm a little bit scared about what I got myself into because this is the first class of the first day. And this is multiple days. And I'm like, I'm a white belt. Like, I don't know anything. This is, this is wild. But I didn't realize how much I had actually learned from him already. And this was mm. the sort of thing that cemented me and said, I had the itch from that first interaction of experiencing pain and experiencing uh, the reality of the martial arts. And this was the sense of belonging and sense of discipline and family that I think that my life needed that really cemented it for me. That first camp was wildly exciting. I came out with so many bruises. The, uh, there, was one, there was one of the brown belt candidates about the same size as me, um, and I'm not a small man. Um, he, when we do our rising blocks, our rising blocks are actually a punch. And he was punching my triceps. The idea is that you get up under their arm when they try to come down on you with a high strike. And he was just trying to prove and trying to demonstrate this technique for me, I guess. But I'm a white belt. He's a brown belt. We're like at opposite ends of the spectrum for the Q ranks. And he's just nailing me over and over again. And I'm like, this sucks, but it works. This is really cool stuff. That's how I got started <laughs> by being beat up <laughs> a little bit. There, there's some fun stuff in there, you know, obviously the... The symbolism of, you know, kind of that, that old school throwback of you having to seek out your teacher in the middle of the night and training in the almost dark. I mean, that, that's a great visual. Uh, and, and I'm guessing the listeners can appreciate that and, and see that in the same way that I am now. But I'm wondering about that weekend, that camp weekend, because you go in... And you admitted that you're feeling a bit uncomfortable, out of place. You know, you're, the, you're dressed differently. You're wearing a belt that even then you probably knew was too small. Yeah, it only went around once. Okay. Right? They're supposed to go around twice. Right. It only went around once and I was able to nod it. <laughs> you don't really know what's going on. You don't know the people that are there. I mean, there's a probably even more that's foreign to you on that day than most people when they start their first class, you know, cause this isn't even a class setting that's conducive to someone's first day. So it feels like there's an opportunity there for someone to really get pushed away from the martial arts. And yet you were pulled in from that experience. Was it, was it the experience? Do you think you had this really strong predisposition you, you said earlier that you were had always been interested in martial arts you know if, if you know what i'm going for can you unpack that a little bit because i think there might be a lesson in there for people that are teaching new students sure so again i'm 19 years old i'm i'm out on this really hot day these people are like, they have an ama they have amazing form. They're all doing things together. Like when the person in the front calls something, they all do it in sequence. Um, and I think what spoke to me and what really sort of didn't push me away, what pulled me in was I tried so hard. It's like the... the I remember the awkwardness of trying to like looking over my shoulder at the person next to me, looking at people up in front, try to see what they're doing. Um, and then having Sensei Smith come around and very gently, without a word, catch your arm when it's out, 
reposition your fist, readjust your arm, like kick one of your feet like he's kicking a tire to put it in the right position, and just adjust your structure. Mm. And and it was he just he didn't have an air of like you're doing this wrong. It was like let me help you. It was a mm. very different attitude. It wasn't like nope 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 let's do this differently. It was here let me help. Would it be fair to say guiding versus correcting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was definitely guidance. Uh, it was um, much like we do with the martial arts. It's easier to redirect something than it is to stop it. Mm. And so he was very good at redirecting what I was doing and, and to guide me in the right path. And I just felt so included by that, that mm. he came to me like he's the highest ranked person there. And he came to me, the lowest ranked person there. And took the time to do the corrections, and he wasn't his ego wasn't in the way of that. His he, it was just the it was the way he teaches is the way he wanted to do it, and and that inclusion was really helpful to me. It, um, and those adjustments because I could I'm I'm an I'm an analytical person I'm an intellectual person, and I could I was taking mental note of the things he was doing. I was like, oh my fist is turned this way I have to turn it the other way my arm isn't bent right I have to adjust this my other arm isn't coming back to the right point I have to, and I and I can when he would make those adjustments I was able to take the mental notes and so it was a nice marriage of that guidance nice. and reflection nice I, I hope the people that are listening if anyone is an instructor if anyone has influence over how a new student is sort of onboarded into a martial arts class. You take notice and, and maybe even go back and listen to the last few minutes because I, I think there's some valuable lessons in there. So let's let's talk about stories. I've heard some great martial arts stories from you. Of course, you know we're, we're friends. Listeners have probably picked up on that. You're in my house, right? I don't yeah. generally invite strangers to my house to record an episode. But I, I mean, I might if they were local and somebody I liked. I don't know. <laughs> But I guess we're friends at that point if I like them. So take a second. Think if you need to. What's your best martial arts story? I'd say one of the best. Um, so out of those camps, I've been to now four of them, including my own. Um, each with their own distinct stories to go with them. Mm. It was my third camp. Um, so the first camp, when I was a white belt, I actually got a heat stroke. <laughs> it was so hot, so bad. Second second one, uh, I got a kidney stone. <laughs> Thankfully, it was at the end of camp. So I didn't miss out on anything. We were having this big barbecue. I got a kidney stone right after the barbecue. It was terrible. Did you pass it there? I did oh, that God. night, yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, uh, there's nothing you can do for a kidney stone, but do its let it do its thing. Uh, but the third camp, so the third camp, I must have been a purple belt, maybe a maybe a blue belt, which is the first of our high ranks. I know every every system has their own colored belts, and they're in different places. But for us, that's the that's fifth Q, yeah, fifth Q or sixth Q. I was right about there. So it's about halfway through our ranking system. Um, and there was this day that we were pushing so hard. We it was it was the last full day of camp. And that morning I I'm in my tent and I remember trying to sit up and I couldn't because we had done so much grappling and so many sit-ups that my abs were just it was just painful to try and sit up. It was painful. Mm. And so I'm like, okay, how am I going to do this? I got to get in my tent. We got class in half an hour. I got to get up and like limber up a little bit before this happens. So I roll over onto my side in my tent, throw off my sleeping bag and like try to like push myself up. And I get out of bed slowly, lumber out of my tent, see other people doing the same thing including the Brownville candidates, which have been worked really hard. And we're 
we're all coming out of our tents and we go to class and somehow we get through it. Like before, like half hour ago, I'm unable to sit up, but now we're in class. We're doing our basics and we're going to do more sit-ups and more push-ups. It's brutal. We end up doing it. It hurts. We go through, we train for another five or six hours. We have another class after that around noon, one o'clock, we have another class. And in between that second and third class, so we have usually have three full classes a day and there's training all the time between the classes, the formal classes. In between that second and third class, I remember, we had just done a class where we were, we have to do a number of mat drills because of our martial art has a lot of groundwork in it. And we have all these mats set up in a really long row and you have to do these different mat drills all the way down it, all the way back, whether you're rolling or if you're swimming is what we call it, or um, many different types of swimming. We're doing all these different drills. We're all worn out. I'm still like, I've gone through two classes now after thinking I couldn't sit up. And I'm sitting down next to the mat because this is, we're, we're, the class is over now. This is just optional train, like optional training for Q ranks. It's still highly encouraged that you keep working because yeah. it's a great opportunity to get in and learn the stuff you sure. need for your rank. Yeah. Like learn the stuff you get to practice and you get help. But I'm taking a break for, I, I actually don't recall how long it was. It could have been two minutes. It could have been five minutes. It could have been 10 minutes. It could have been a half hour. I don't know. But I, I'm sitting the distance that you and I are sitting right now. For those listening, we're sitting about three feet apart from each other. I'm sitting really close to the mat. I'm just sitting with my legs crossed, my hands on my knees, sitting up straight, just trying to breathe and feed my muscles some oxygen. And then there's these other younger martial artists that are like, tumbling down this mat like wildly like they still have so much energy some of the younger i mean kids just go forever but they're they're still going and it was this this moment of really strange clarity of understanding my own body i was thinking about i couldn't sit up today but somehow i just i've been throwing myself down this mat that engages my abs and my legs and my whole body to do some of these maneuvers, but I'm sitting here right now. I'm about to get up and do some more. Am I crazy? Am I, am I, am, does this make me masochistic? I don't think so. I don't think this is, that's what this is about. I don't like the pain at all, but it's, it's then I understood like the pursuit of this the why of why I do martial arts. I don't do it because it hurts. I actually don't like that. <laughs> I mean, we were doing some wrist locks earlier today. They don't feel good. I don't like that. But I like the knowledge. I like the, I like expanding my brain and, ex and, and understanding what I know about my own body and what I am capable of. When my mind says, no, you don't get to sit down. It's time for your rest is over now. You have to get back on the mat. And it, there's not, I haven't done anything else besides martial arts that has made me have to make that decision. Nothing else has put my mind and body in that situation where I have to choose. No, you have to get up. You have to, you have to keep going. And that was self-imposed. Again, this is optional time. We're not in class right now. But this is like, this is my time to learn because I like that knowledge. I want to learn more. This is my time to take advantage of that. And so that self-motivation, that self-guidance was not something that, it wasn't a tool, a skill set that I was taught by a teacher or a parent or a sibling or anybody else in my life that was self-discovered in hmm. a moment of rest between kicking my own butt. <laughs> it's pretty powerful. And it's an experience that I don't know a lot of people 
even a lot of martial artists that stumble on that realization of their own accord. I think for a lot of us, it's almost forced upon us. Um, I mean, the closest thing I have to that story involves my black belt test. And I know plenty of other people that had that epiphany at their black belt test. So for you to realize it out of choice and out of, you know, and in, in earlier in your martial arts career, I think says a lot about who you are as a person. And I'm going to guess if we can, you know, look back 20 years from now, it'll say a lot about your martial arts path. You know, you're, you're, you've, some would say that earning your black belt is really the first significant step, you know? So if we think of it this way, you've got so much ahead of you in, in terms of years and knowledge and practice and whatnot that uh, I'm guessing that realization is going to serve you pretty well. And it's interesting too, because that's not something I'll ever bring up really in class as mm -hmm. an instructor. I've, I've, I taught for a while at dealer.com. Um, one of our students from there that, that, uh, is attending our school now in Winooski. And I would never think to teach that in a class. Maybe it's because it's the way I learned it organically, mm. but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like something you can really teach. You can sort of try to display it and model it. And that's probably the closest you can get to it, but it's definitely one of those things that, Somebody has to turn that key in your in your head. Then someone can't do it for you. You have to do it yourself. Yeah. You have to turn that key. I agree. So let's talk about stuff that's not martial arts for a second. Okay. Other than work and training, which is about 95% of my life. What do you do when you're not doing martial arts, when you're not at work? Do you have other hobbies or interests? I am interested in so many things. So I really, really enjoy travel, mm. uh, especially with my wife. My wife and I have been on a couple of trips now together abroad that have been really great. We've done a number of smaller trips. We've done road trips around our own country. That's I love travel. I love experiencing cultures very different from my own and experiencing their foods, experiencing their different folkways and mores, experiencing everything I can just to understand humanity better. That's really exciting to me. I'm also into lots of really nerdy things. I'm really into video games. I'm into tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. I'm also, um, I'm in a community of people that do live action role-play, which is sort of a great marriage of tabletop role-playing with martial arts, and improvisational acting. Mm. It's really a, a really fun environment with lots of people that care about having good quality, safe, fun, and um, there's a good amount of hitting each other with padded weapons. Um, that's that's a lot of fun too. But it's it's a really creative environment that is both intellectual and physical and you're out in the woods for a weekend. And I think that's good for anybody. Um, I've always said to people who want to try it, I said at the very least, you're going to be out in the woods for a weekend and that's good for everyone. Yeah. I think the woods is just where humans are meant to be. And it's it's a, one of my favorite places to be. I, I just instantly feel calmer out there. I also like disc golf, another thing in the woods. Um, my wife and I both play disc golf, various courses around here. Um, it's just a walk in the woods with an objective. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, you're going to be out there for at least an hour, maybe hour and a half, depending on how bad you play. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a really great time, especially this time of year in the fall. It's really beautiful. Mm. I also love to cook. And I'm surprised I haven't said it already. I actually got my degree in music. Uh, my undergraduate degree in music, and I, I also have a master's, but I, my undergraduate degree was, um, I studied classical voice and jazz guitar, so I sing, and I play guitar, and a plethora of other instruments as well, and I write music, 
I used to play out a lot more. I think I mentioned earlier in the show I played in a band. Um, that was a lot of fun. I actually played bass in that band. But now I pretty much just write songs for guitar, and I experiment a little bit with electronic music. That's the longest <laughs> list we've ever had in response to that question. Usually it's it's one of two things. It's I don't have time for anything else between my family, my friends, my job, and martial arts. Or it's I also like to do X. And I think we just got A through Z. <laughs> yeah. I I got a comment at my black belt test that I won't give too much away, but my teacher said that I bring passion to all that I do. And I would say part of that passion is I describe it more as nerd rage. <laughs> and, that, and that if there's something that I really like, I just, I will nerd rage out on it. And I will like not put it down until I've, I've completed the thought or completed the, like whatever it is mm -hmm. until I've like finished my, my, the taste of in my, what I've think I have in my mind. If, unless I've made it real, then it's hard for me to put it down. Um, I've done that a number of times. It seems like the common thread through arguably all of those things is a creative side. Yeah. You know, would you I, agree I grew up, that you're I, a strongly grew, creative person? My, my mother was a musician and a painter, and right. uh, she, she was pretty much a single parent for uh, uh, me and my siblings uh, growing up. And so we always had music in the house. We always... I mean, she was a painter. She was always painting very beautiful work. And um, and through that, she knew other artists. And so I would meet other musicians that would play. Like the first instrument I got was from a family friend who was also a musician, gave me an instrument, gave me a mm. bass guitar at that time. Um, and it's, I've always appreciated anything creative. Uh, artisan crafts of any any sorts whether anything that's well made um i don't pretty i don't particularly appreciate anything that's handmade there's still a, a scale of things that are good <laughs> and things that are bad sure. there are chintzy things out there but i i appreciate appreciate so much artisanal work um my in-laws are glass blowers and they make beautiful glass and uh art glass and art architectural glass and they they live that creative life they have for 40 years and it's very nurturing to me to be around that type of those types of people that um that follow their heart and bring what's in their heart and mind into reality whether it's a blacksmith who has this idea for a really cool knife and he's going to beat the snot out of this this piece of metal until he gets the thing that he wants but it takes the knowledge the combination of knowledge and physical skill and dexterity to be able to end up with this end product of something beautiful of something useful of something that is tangibly real um we fundamentally change we change the world if you think about it that way, it's a small thing, but you change the world when you create something. Yeah. You've, you've brought something into existence that wasn't there. It's the like... same way when you innovate in martial arts. When you, mm -hmm. you, you, if, if you've studied different styles like, like you do, you can piecemeal the different things together and say, I check out this thing. Like, What do you think about this? And you have this exchange of ideas with other martial artists, and you create something that never existed before. It might be based on things that lots of people have done over and over. And there might even be someone who did a similar technique. But for that moment, you've created something absolutely unique. Yeah, there's a lot of fun in that. Some, some magic in manifesting. And nerd rage. And nerd rage, <laughs> which is a word I've never heard before, but I feel like I'm going to have to find a way to work it into my vocabulary. Well, it, it also, I mean, it means a couple of different things. It means someone going ranty about something they love. Or it also means someone who is doing one of those activities that people of nerdy types like myself do gets really upset and leaves. That's also <laughs> okay. that's also nerd raging. Okay. Yeah. So there's there's a positive and a negative side. There certainly to nerd is. Rage. There certainly is. All right. Uh, so 
possibly not in the nerd rage vein, but maybe, I don't know, we'll find out. Tell us about a low point in your life and how your martial arts training helped you move through that time. Right out of college, undergraduate school, I lived with um, my now wife, my then girlfriend, and I worked part-time at a cafe making coffees for people, and it's pretty low-key. I was working maybe like 25 hours a week. I was going to martial arts class. That was pretty much the only other activity at that time I was doing, besides some of my other hobbies, but like the only like scheduled activity was yeah. martial arts class and going to work, rinse and repeat. Um, we moved after that to our first place together um, off of a college campus. We got our first apartment in Winooski, Vermont. Little tiny one bedroom, maybe 500 square feet. And I got my first job working retail, which was hard. It's getting underpaid and overworked. Very thankless job where strangers come in and yell at you. And they've got something going on in their lives that makes them feel like that's okay. And I'm still going to martial arts. Thankfully, the school that I went to was very affordable, very inexpensive to continue classes because... They care more about you being there than about making money. And so I'm still able to go there working at Best Buy. We're scraping by, but my girlfriend knows this is important to me. So it's an okay expense to come out of our household. Like we're trying to pay for this apartment, both fresh out of school. And I just, there were times like when you're starting off and struggling and trying to get on your feet where you're just quite literally like struggling to get up to go to work today because I'm telling myself like all these colleges make all these promises after you get your degree, you'll be able to get an amazing job, whatever. They make all these promises that are really unrealistic and you're sort of wrapping your head around, this is the real world. This is like the term that so many people have used prior to you getting to this point. Like, well, in the real world, this and this thing happens, this thing doesn't happen. Um, and it was a moment where I realized it's me and it's her and we got to make this work. And while this is a job I have right now, I'm not going to go to this job and realize that people are going to yell at me first because some people go in there on a mission. They just want to go in and they want to vent at someone they don't know in retail. That just happens. But I decided that if I can like find myself barely able to sit up in a tent can I stand up having been well rested and let someone yell at me and just let them do their thing and realize it's not me. It's I have the not just physical strength that I have accumulated through training in martial arts, but I have the mental strength to deal with that situation in a way that doesn't end with me going home demoralized. It doesn't end with me feeling lesser because this person decides they want to come in. And that's just one example of the sorts of things that would happen there. Or it would just, sometimes it wouldn't be a customer. It'd be like, I have to go through and clean every single one of these televisions. I have to go through and neatly stack all of these boxes. And I just, mm. and I chose, I could do this sloppily and I could do this poorly or I could do it well, and I could 
leave my mark on this place as someone who passed through and did a good job. And I was like, is it more befitting of me and of my character to be known as the guy who came in and would talk back to customers and was grumpy all the time, or the guy that came in and never did the other jobs that were really expected, or the guy, or I left with a very positive note. Every time I go back there, the manager remembers me and says, hey, you want to come back? Hey, you need a job? I mean, I would never work there again in my life, <laughs> but it's nice to know that I left that impression yeah. that they, that, that they, that I didn't leave. I wasn't just another one of the many high turnover employees there. Yeah. And that really helped me to uh, mentally deal with the abuse that happens in retail. Don't be that person if you're listening. Don't go in and yell at people. They're people. <laughs> people are people. Yeah. And no one deserves to be yelled at. It's true. You took that in a different direction than I thought you were going to when you started. But it makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I'm right there with you. Yeah. I mean, life was, it, I was struggling to be optimistic and it helped me stay optimistic because I, I had the mental exercise to do it. Over the time that we've been friends, we've talked about quite a few people that you've had the chance to train with. And so we'll, we'll take Sensei Smith out from this list, but who would you say has been the most influential person in your martial arts career? If I have to narrow it down to one outside of my direct instructor, I'd say it was senior grandmaster Rick Alamany. And the first time I spoke to him, I spoke to him on the telephone and this is a person, if people aren't familiar with him, um, he's a student of great grandmaster Ralph Castro. He is a 10th degree in Shaolin Kempo. He calls it Alamany Kempo now, but that's the, that's the, uh, the style, its roots are Shaolin Kempo. Um, when I first talked to him on the phone, he was just so incredibly nice. <laughs> he, he was so interested in what I was doing in the martial arts. He'd never met me before, but he's really curious. I mean, I'm across the country. He's in San Francisco. I was at the time, Burlington, Vermont, and I remember I'm laying on the bed talking to this guy. I'm like, holy crap, I'm talking to Rick Alamany on the phone. Which I'm sure you get all the time when you're interviewing people. Like before your interview, you're yeah, like, holy crap, yeah. I'm about to talk to this person. I'm, I'm feeling that for the first time. Feeling a little starstruck because I know this guy's past. He's, he's done huge tournament circuits. Was a very successful tournament fighter. Um... He went back later in his 50s after having been retired from tournaments. He said, I'm going to go back and I'm going to beat everyone. And he went back and he beat everyone. <laughs> and he ended up taking a huge title. I don't remember the name of that tournament, but he went back and did a circuit and beat everyone in his age group. Um, but I remember talking to him and he had such immense humility, which is an oxymoron. But it's it was amazing He's had such immense humility, and he still does. And the reason I was calling him was because I was like, you know, my teachers talk to you a lot. I'd really like to set up a trip to come out and train with you. I think it'd be really awesome. And he's like, sounds awesome. I've got a couple of students that have schools that'd be pretty accessible. You get out here to San Francisco, we'll set up a time, and we'll, we'll train. So we get out there. San Francisco's beautiful, by the way. And me and my teacher, we have to teach a little bit to him, share some of our knowledge, and then we're going to train and do some of his stuff. And and my teacher and I are training outside of our um, 
a family member's house, my one of my wife's family's house. We're outside, out on their patio. We just like found some sticks on the ground and we're doing some stick work with these sticks um, that we just picked up off the ground and um, rehearsing what we're gonna teach. Preparing mentally to, to, to show our skill for this very respected, um, very great martial artist and great man. And we get to this amazing dojo that's probably been running for, my guess is it's got to be, it's got to be running for at least 40 years, maybe more than that. The floors are hardwood floors that are like a little bit, I mean, squeaky. They move around. They've had a lot of feet on them. They've had a lot of training in this room. You can sort of feel it when you walk in there, just the amount of training that's happened in this space. It was actually uh, Senior Grandmaster Alamany's former school that he had, one of his students had bought the building from him, I think, mm -hmm. and had been taking over teaching the, their style there. And it's just me, my teacher, Master Aaron Wynn from uh, from Maine, one of his top students, um, a friend who's another martial artist. Um, I don't remember his title, but a gentleman from uh, Miguel Jurna, I think is his name. Uh, he's from San Francisco Bay Area, I think, or not far from there. Uh, he came to film for us. He's also a very successful martial artist. So there's this wealth of knowledge there. And then Senior Grand Grandmaster Alamany is there with one of his students who's a sixth degree. And then um, his other student, um, uh, forget his title, but John Nash. A lot of names that I had heard a number of times before I got here. And so like, there's some hype in my in my head too, but I'm like, part of me, the intellectual side's like, is this going to be, is this going to live up to the hype? Mm. Is this like, is, is this like, is this real? Is this really happening? Like it's so many things going through my head. And so I'm going to train with this, with this guy. And he looks, he's hobbling around a little bit. He's got both of his hips replaced at this point, which seems to happen a lot in martial arts, joint replacements. But he's like hobbling around and he blew my mind. Not only for his knowledge, uh, I mean, he knows his system inside and out. He's a 10th degree. He knows the system fluently. But when we learned the kata there, we learned it through bunkai. And and, and his school, when you do bunkai... What's bunkai? For people that might not know oh, the term. So bunkai is when you take a pattern or a form and you have attackers and you apply it against attackers... It, I think it literally means practical application mm. or something very close to that translation. Um, and the way that they do it at their school, they do it two different ways. You either have a line of attackers and you fend off each of them, each of them throwing different types of attacks. Or you do it to four winds, meaning to four cardinal directions. We were doing, we did both there. Mainly, we did the line style. But I remember I got almost a sense of conditioned fear mm. of Senior Grandmaster Alamany because I knew that when I would get to him in the line and he was either attacking me or he was the one doing it and, and doing a technique to me, he was so precise and he hit hard. <laughs> He, again, he must have been 70, maybe 73, 74. I don't know how, I think he's 79 now. I have to double check that. But he's not a young man. He's a very experienced man. And he's doing this on each of us, very different body types. I'm six foot four, almost 300 pounds. Another guy in the line is probably five foot four. Another guy is five six. Another guy is. 5'8". I'm just guesstimating here. All different body types. And every single one of us 
he was so sharp, so fast, that this was, to me, like, he didn't mean to. He's so humble. He's so happy. He's like, this guy floats back and forth from San Francisco to Hawaii, like, really beautiful places. He, he's a very relaxed guy. <laughs> but I was like, man, I do not want to take another one of those knife hands to the inside of my elbow. Like, I really <laughs> don't want that. But we're training for another two hours, so I'm going to keep taking it. <laughs> but we trained with five, for five hours with him. Wow. And, and he kept going. Like, this guy, totally inspiring to be in his 70s, going totally like Master Yoda on me, is totally what it was. Because he'd go from hobbling to, like, moving. And when he would move... He would, he would hit you, <laughs> and you'd. I learned so much about that, like that every body is different. You might learn a technique, and you might do it against the air, but unless you practice against different body types, they don't. It doesn't always work the same way on every person. You're gonna have to learn to improvise and be creative in order to make it work against that body type. If you always have the same training partner in class, you're going to know how to work on someone that size and with the muscles in those places or the different tissues built up in different places. Uh, you're not going to really round out your education. And he was sort of exemplified that. And it was another moment of clarity for me in understanding what this is all about. It's about understanding. It's about knowing our bodies in a in a way that other activities don't really provide you. Yeah. On a bicycle, you're not going to learn how another person rides a bike. Like, if someone else is punching at me, I'm going to have to learn how they punch to defend against their punch. That's a great point. Mm. Probably a more long-winded answer, but it was really a a wild experience to train with him. You listen to the show. You know I love tangents. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. If you could train with anybody that you haven't, who would that be? See, I thought about this question so much. And, and it's actually, I think I'd probably train with um, a celebrity martial artist um, only because I think that he would show me things wildly different from what I do. Um, and he also has an amazing physique. <laughs> but Donnie Yen yeah. is... I've watched videos of him when he's a, like a teenager. Like when he's just like training with his friends. And he's just doing insanely acrobatic martial arts that are not just powerful and acrobatic but they're so precise like he's he was an excellent martial artist that made his way into movies very similar to bruce lee in that in that sense made sense that he would play Ip Man, but it, but that same sense of powerful physique powerful martial artist gone uh movie star that uh He's always inspired me as a martial artist because um, they just move with a different confidence. Yeah. I'd love to be able to do a seminar with him. <laughs> I had the opportunity to train with someone who went to high school for a time with him. Oh. Because he, he's got nice. roots in Boston and really trying to get this person on the show. So, um you know, I've got a couple of people working on that for me, like, because I, you know, I didn't get to spend enough time with this person. But um, from the little bit of the stories that they told, he's always been incredible. Talking about, you know, getting in fights in the bathroom in high school and just <laughs> crazy stuff like that. So maybe we can get some more Donnie Yen stories on the show. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? So I'd say that my, my favorite is probably Fearless with Jet Li. Mm. Jet Li is another one of my um, 
one of my favorite martial arts actors. And he's done a plethora of movies. But uh, that one in particular, I think it may have been maybe the second or third movie I'd seen with him. Okay. And it sort of showed a dynamic range of what he could do as an actor as well as what he could do as a martial artist. And it was a nice blend between fun and drama. Yeah, there, there's something special about a martial arts movie that has a plot. Right. Because uh, a lot of them do not. And of course, you can always appreciate a collection of fight scenes. But when you start to care about the characters, there's a little bit more value in it. Is he your favorite actor or not somebody else? I, I don't think I can narrow it down to one. It's so hard. I really like Jet Li. I really like Donnie Yen. I'm so outrageously excited that Donnie Yen is going to be in Star Wars. And as soon as you said outrageously I, excited, I knew exactly I, where you were going to go. I, I love Star Wars is my favorite franchise, hands down. And the fact that Donnie Yen is going to be in it is blowing my mind a little bit. And I really cannot wait for Rogue One to come out so yeah. I can see what they do with him in a Star Wars movie. My guess is they must have made him like a, a Force-sensitive but untrained for sensitive fighter is my guess is that he's the few clips that we've seen with him. He's doing some pretty wild stuff. So I, I'm, that's my guess. I just want to see him with a lightsaber. I don't think he'll have a lightsaber. I want to he see might, him. but that would be amazing. Right? Like <laughs> I, I understand that it's not really, at least from what we see of, of his movies, his wheelhouse but but the the nerd intersection like of Donnie Yen staff. with a lightsaber, some anything, something. I just I, I think that it could be an absolutely terrible movie, and if Donnie Yen wields a lightsaber, I'll be happy. Yeah, yeah, he he is amazing. I actually just recently started getting into Bruce Lee movies, so I wasn't part of the era that got to experience that for the phenomenon that it was. Mm. And I, I really enjoy some of those. Some of them are, at this point, with the evolution of film, are are comical. Yep. Um, I mean, almost to the point where they feel Jackie Chanish. Some of them because the plots are so thin. Yeah. Like they they're really they're really about the martial arts, and the martial arts are really fun. Um, I remember like hearing about an interview with. Jackie Chan being a stunt stunt person actually getting hurt by Bruce Lee at some point. Yeah, in yeah. Enter the Dragon. Enter the yeah, he actually had gotten hurt, but he just went with it because it's this it's for the for the film. Yeah, that was a um but I appreciate any movie with martial arts, even the cheesiest ones. I I'm a big fan of um what people call B movies or even C movies, because even if their plot isn't necessarily executed right, they might have a little nugget in there, like a little moral that's that means something, hmm. something valuable. Um, I was a big fan of those old terrible fantasy shows, Hercules and Xena. Those were like really you bad. and a lot of people. Yeah, they were really bad, but they had but every single one of their shows had some cheesy plot, cheesy moral in the end that was like, that's the nugget of why they made this episode. Right. <laughs> there's, yeah. There's a lot of great stuff out there. I wouldn't watch any of those for great martial arts. The, the, <laughs> those, <laughs> um, but I like that caliber of plot. It doesn't need to be Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which I love too. It doesn't need yeah. to be that level of beauty and plot. For me to like it. How about books? Any martial arts books? So I've read a few. Okay. And I wouldn't say that there's one as a whole that I love. Okay. There are excerpts from a number of them that I really, really like. There's a book by my teacher's teacher. I believe it's entitled, This is Self-Defense. 
And it goes over a number of different concepts from conflict management all the way through pictures and diagrams of doing techniques. It has a picture of my instructor in that book. Um, and I don't think it's in print anymore. Uh, but that's by uh, Professor Frank Ricardo. Mm. And it it does have a lot of really great nuggets in it. But as a whole, I'm not, it's, I'm not, I wouldn't call it my favorite, but I'm always a person who says there's always more work to be done. And I'm sure that if he were to write another book, it'd be a different book (laughs) because he's got more to say. And so that there's no completed work out there. There are some that are pretty close, but um, that's probably the one I've, that sits with me the most because it's also, it talks about techniques of the style, the, the discipline that I study. Yep. Um, but I've also read a number of other books uh, that have um, like The Art of War, which has m- mainly its strategy and proverb-like readings, but those are um, those aren't really it's not really a martial arts manual or a or a way to fight. It's more of that's like mindset. No, but it's funny. Um, we haven't talked about it on the show, but uh, over on the blog at whistlekick.com, I went back through the first like 120, 115 episodes and took all the the favorite actors, favorite movies, favorite books, and those are rolling out as as ranked pieces and in the book one art of war was top 10 i think top five even though you're right it's not a martial arts book right it's written by a martial strategist and Mm -hmm. military general (laughs) um which has similar principles in the end another book that the name escapes me that we'll definitely be able to get you for the show notes um is a book by James Mitosi that's out of print. And that one... Was that the one, What is Self-Defense? That might be it. What is Self-Defense? Yeah. Is, I, I bet that's the title. To listeners, I'm not just clairvoyant uh, at, at Mr. Hart's test. Uh, I had the opportunity to look at these books that his instructor had. They are, they are, that one is definitely out of print. And... It's one of a stack that my teacher likes to carry around with him. And that one was a gift to him. You might be able to find it from a couple of used booksellers for a, a really good price. Might be like $280. Yeah. But more than likely, it's going to be 300 or more to um, to try and find that book. But it's, yeah. it's a really sought-after book. Uh, among a certain generation of martial artists. Low production book from a legendary martial artist. We'll be doing a profile episode on Matosi at some point. But there's a lot of really great content in that book that um, you can literally do the equivalent of spinning a globe and putting your finger down. You can flip through that book and stop at a page and find something good in it. You don't have to mm. like have the full context. You will find something good in it. It's a um, it's really a great lexicon of knowledge. Nice. And of course, for anybody that might be new, maybe hasn't listened to this show before, we put all these show notes up at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So all the books and the movies and everything that Mr. Hart is talking about, we'll have links over there. So let's talk about your your goals. I mean, obviously, you haven't stopped training in a way. We talked that you've really just taken your first big step. So what's what do you, what do you got planned? Like, what's keeping you motivated? Other than I want to keep going. I want to keep learning. I mean, not that those aren't significant goals, but is there something more specific you can point to? Yeah, there certainly is. Okay. So I currently work at an academic institution. Uh, I work at the University of Vermont 
and I would like to pursue a PhD in education. That's, that's still just part of my means to my end. So my end is I would love to be able to open a, a martial arts school that is embedded into a community. I want everybody in town to know not what we do, but why we do it. Mm. And the why has been for me a huge motivator. Why do I, why am I going, why am I testing for a black belt? Why, once I have my black belt, why do I want to keep doing martial arts? It's something I ask myself a lot. And the why is because I think that there is value that this particular platform can provide a community uh, between discipline and body awareness and other services that a school that uh, one of my, um, not a mentor, but someone I look up to um, does is they, they offer after school programs, before school programs, summer camps, places yeah. as a really safe place where kids can go and they have they have the support they need. They have, in this case, I'm, I'm hoping to get my PhD in education and my wife really wants to be involved and she has a master's in education and she's a licensed teacher. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to provide services like tutoring and even just fun after school activities in addition to having a martial arts focus. Okay. So when you're part of this after school program, you also get to come back for classes nice. when you're and and having this environment that the community can really associate with contribution and it's not just they're trying to get people like i've never been a fan of the mcdojo as they're often referred to on the martial arts subreddit <laughs> uh mcdojos are places where there are black belt farms you yeah. go in and in two or three years you come out with a black belt and I'm not. It's gonna, about the money rather than really. The it's, education. it's a money centric system where they're binding people to contracts, and you can have whole conversations about the philosophy of how you should run your martial arts business. But I'm not going to get into that right now. But my focus is that I want to have a positive community impact, and have that be my focus, and not money. Generally, if you do those really good things, and you try to do right by people. The money just happens. Mm -hmm. That's that's been proven by a couple of different really amazing martial artists at West, um, and the people he mentors directly. Um, and it's a really great model. And it's really just be good to people, and you'll see the fruit from it. That's like the main goal behind it. Yeah. And it and it works. People like when they're treated fairly. They do. That's my, so that's my goal is to open a, open a school and probably as a day job, in addition to that, because I'll probably hire staff to supplement that. I'll probably be focused more on the martial arts and designing curriculum and things like that um, and managing the business. I'll probably be teaching at the college level. That's sort of my end goal, too. I'd, I'd love to be a college professor and a teacher of the martial arts. So what do you want to teach in college? I I have a very mixed background. I have an undergraduate degree in music. Mm -hmm. I have a master's in managing innovation in IT. Mm -hmm. so it's really like an IT MBA. And I want to study education. So I think that what I'd really like to hone in on in my PhD work is not only learning how people learn, but learning about the effectiveness of teaching. Because right now our country is filled with standardized tests and filled with a number of different systems that don't appear to be succeeding. There are certain pockets where schools are doing great. And schools will do great when you have teachers that love their jobs and mm -hmm. you've got great communities supporting them. And that'll happen regardless of what system they're operating and if the people love what they're doing. And But we have schools where where it's failing and we're, we're, we're failing those communities. Mm -hmm. And so I want to, 
I'd like to study what they're doing in depth and understand method and the current paradigm and figure out how that can be shifted, how it can be rearranged the same way we would rearrange a punch to make it right or to guide it in the right way and gather some real data on not just are they passing test scores, but if you put this thing in front of them, do they understand it? If you put a book in front of them, is are, are you concentrating so much on like understanding the vocabulary that they're forgetting like what the actual book's about? They're just trying to sound out this word so hard because you've been drilling them about I before or yeah, I before E. If you're drilling them on that thing, like what are, what pieces are missing? Right. I mean, I'm still scratching the surface here. I haven't even started the PhD program yet, but how we learn and is the way that is what we're doing effective. Does it stick? Hmm. I can get behind that. I think there's a lot we can learn from. There's a lot of schools around the world that are doing some really innovative things. And I'd like to be able to teach about that. Innovation in education. Okay. Right on. Now, if someone's listening and they want to get a hold of you, they want to um, debate some of these subjects you've brought up or, you know, whatever. Bring you know, it. <laughs> is there is there a way they can get a hold of you yep uh i'm on twitter i'm on facebook um i have a youtube channel for my music if you're interested to singer songwriter stuff i've got stuff on there um those are great ways to get a hold of me what's your twitter handle it's probably an easy one it's at vt songwriter 09 okay and of course we'll have all the social media links over in the show notes too sure thing any parting advice for people listening? Well, I'm going to I'm going to focus on martial arts. Okay. And I would say if you love it, don't let anyone stop you from it. If you if you have a conflict with a teacher or a conflict with a student, there's something that might be preventing you from continuing your education. Find a way to work past that. Try to find another school, try to find a way to, to work around that conflict, to resolve the conflict. That's the ideal situation, is if you can confront that situation and, and in an appropriate way, that you are able to continue your education I've seen a number of people be run into sticky situations where they have a teacher that has a big ego or they have, um, they have a money centric school or they have a, another student that's something of a rival or they, they, they have something blocking them from continuing their education, continuing their pursuit of the art and I just wouldn't I, I want everyone to if, if you've had that itch to keep going find a way to keep going don't stop most people that have spent time in the martial arts have developed a number of friendships from their training while I've made numerous friends from the schools I've trained at and visited I have to say that Mr. Hartz has become one of the friendships I most value I think this episode did a good job of showcasing who he is, and I'm lucky to know him. Thank you, Mr. Hartz, for your time. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes, including links, the book titles we talked about today, and a whole bunch more. There's also a place to sign up for that newsletter, hint, hint. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. The username is whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our sort of secret Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Quite a few of you have been joining that group, and we appreciate your contributions to the discussions. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or perhaps your instructor, or you have a recommendation for someone else, head on over to the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and fill out the form there. If you have feedback, we love that too. Go ahead, fill out that form on the website. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. 
And, you know, we're always asking for those reviews because they help push us up in the rankings. And, you know, really, what's this about? We're trying to spread the message to as many people as possible. So those of you that leave reviews, we're probably going to send you a shirt. <laughs> remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our No Sweat Tees. If you're a school owner or a team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.